The Ryan and Rush Show is brought to you by Vision Homes. If you're looking to build a home in North Central West Virginia, visit askvisionhomes.com. Vision Homes, building you a house you're proud to call home. And don't forget to subscribe to The Ryan and Rush Show, but don't take our word for it. Take Coach Nealon's. Hi, this is Coach Don Nealon, and you're watching The Ryan and Rush Show. Please subscribe. And we welcome you in to another edition of the Ryan and Russ Show, your source for West Virginia sports. As you see in the middle box here, we're joined by reoccurring guest Ethan Bach of the Transfer Portal and what is it? The Transfer Portal Report and yep. West Virginia Sports Now. I always forget the report. You know, you're not going in the Transfer Portal, Ethan. No, yeah. <laughs> you're not one of the many thousand going in. Uh, like we said, reoccurring guests. I don't think we've seen you before the season started when we were doing our predictions. We uh, tried to wait for the right time to get you on, Ethan. And well, uh, this past season, there really kind of wasn't the right time. You know, you can only say so much about what happened. But hey, the new era begins. Uh, the DeVries era, we're here. It's transfer portal time. It's a fresh start, clean slate. What do you think about everything that's going on, Ethan? Welcome back. Yeah, thank you, Ryan and Rush. Um, I it's I, I, I just during the coaching search i was just thinking about it and it's like everything since may last year it's felt like forever um i think fans and everybody in the program can agree with that uh but yeah it was a it was a tough year for west virginia i think uh i think josh Tyler and the staff did the best they could with what they were dealt with um especially with all the drama in the summer and then everything else that happened before the season even started. So, uh, but yeah, now we're on a, now we're entering a new era of Mountaineer basketball at Darren Dorees. And uh, I think, I think it's a, I think it was a good hire. I think Bren Baker had his choice and uh, I think it's definitely the safe hire that you can now carry momentum and try to rebuild a new era for uh, West Virginia. Yeah, Ethan, I, I think we all, it's been, a heck of a year. That's that's the best way to describe it. Um, but to talk about Coach DeVries coming over from Drake, was there seven years, got to the tournament three times. What are Mountaineer fans getting with the new era, the new brand of basketball that will be played at the Coliseum next year? Yeah, I think one thing that stuck out to me about DeVries and his teams at Drake was uh, shooting efficiency. Like they were elite. They were pretty much in the one percentile of – uh, taking efficient shots, whether that's three pointers, layups, not not really too much uh, mid range game unless the guy was wide open. Um, but I don't think you're going to see a lot of fadeaways uh, from 15 feet with the shot clock running low. So um, that's that's at least a step. And uh, <laughs> and transition game transition game's not as elite as their uh, efficiency offensively, but. Uh, last season was really good for Drake. And then um, and then on the defense side of the ball, Doris had a couple of solid defensive teams, um, but overall their offense has uh, been their go-to during his tenure there. Going to kind of your neck of the woods, because Doris will, will speak tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Um, but this him, him coming to West Virginia now, uh, a new era, something we're not used to here. Uh, and then you on top of that, you have a transfer portal, right? So this is the first time in West Virginia men's basketball history where you have those two things going on at one time. So so it's it's a new world out there, a world we're still trying to figure out, a world where I think the most we talked about it, right, was Raekwon Battle in, in, in the, the court case and how many times they can transfer. And I think they're still figuring that out. Before we kind of get to the specifics of, of the DeVries impact here at West Virginia, what is your thoughts overall on the transfer portal landscape right now, Ethan? Is is you know they shortened it right to a, to a forty five day window from a sixty day. We're kind of in that area of no man's land where I feel we feel it a little more with football because of bowl games and it's not as many basketball games and you don't have as many tour, you know. But you're still in that no man's land of hey, we got a coach right now. Drake needs to fill a coach, and then the coach that fills in at Drake they'll need to fill. So you have these domino effects on the coaching front. You have then one player go. And, and it just seems like chaos. What what can you tell us about the landscape right now since you're really inside of it? Yeah, chaos is a good word to describe it. Um, 
you asked me before the show, how do you keep track with every single kid? But you can't like, I, th- yeah. I think it, we're at the point now where coaches, media fans, we can't keep up with it. Like player by player. It's at the point now where you just have to try your best to keep up with it. Um, a thousand entries and it's where we haven't even played the sweet 16 games. That's a lot. Um, I do think it will, I, with the last year of having the COVID options, um, I do think that will go down a little bit. But at the same time, the NCAA is not going to be able to enforce their rules anymore on the on the transfer eligibility. Um, I know it, they've, they're have they allowing guys to transfer multiple times this offseason. Gotcha. But I, I, we're trending in a way where players are going to have all that power. They're going to be able to transfer every single offseason if they wanted to with no waiver or anything. Um, so chaos is a good word. Um, I, I, I think, I think the landscape, it obviously can be fixed. Um, we're just in a weird, we're just in a weird era where it's now a normal thing in college athletics, but at the same time, people really still, still don't know, uh, how to take advantage of it. Uh, and then just the positives and negatives. I, I think, it's it's tough for me to say if when the portal should open. I know people want it to start after the after the season's over uh, all the way, um, but at the same time, you get the guys that didn't play in the postseason. You get them to enter the portal, uh, get their recruitment started early, and I don't see a disadvantage to that. But just combining the transfer portal with the NCAA tournament, uh, NIT, CBI, and then with the coaching carousel, it's it's too much. It's too much for everybody. It it, it is, and, and just from the other aspect of it, coaches that get done with the grueling six month season, then all of a sudden you got to turn around and you got to start crunching film on on who's in the portal and, and stuff like it's it's crazy. It's crazy, but like you said, Ethan, it's not going anywhere, so you got to adapt. Let's talk a little bit about the portal and how it could impact uh, Coach DeVries. Well, I think it's no secret that his son will probably be headed to Morgantown. He's he's a pretty damn good player, two-time Missouri Valley Player of the Year. Could the other guys that have hit the portal in Drake, uh, Wright, Overton, and Wright follow suit, or could you see them pursuing another opportunity? I didn't know how much information you had um, in regards to the Drake guys that have hit the portal so far. Yeah, I, w- I would say outside of Tucker, uh, right, Overton, and right, um, those three right there are kind of in the same boat of they definitely could follow DeRees to Morgantown. Um, but I think they're also taking the opportunity to t- test the portal waters, see what's out there. Um, all, all three of them are at least getting some power six interest, right, and Overton are definitely getting high major interest. Um, and and right's kind of like a glue guy. Uh, Drake fans of it, it, it kind of reminds me of how West Virginia fans loved Gabe Osaboyan. Um, mm-hmm. it, it seemed like a huge deal that he left, and he averaged about seven points as a sophomore, shot 44% from three. So he's more of a perimeter guy, but that it, it just seemed like a huge piece to their to their program. So I think any outside of Tucker, those three guys could definitely join, but at the same time I could see them just feeling what's out there and, uh, and just testing the portal waters. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, if I was in their situation, you would at least have your insurance policy where you're following your coach to a, a power six school. And I mean, see if in, you know, if they're in a situation where they manipulated and, and smart made to get an offer from another school and then, all right, West Virginia, you know, I want to come like, you know, maybe just throw a little bit more to that too. So, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, you would do it in their situation. It's from the overall perspective It also kind of sucks too because it's like yeah there should be these more limitations on it and i know that's ryan when you were you know in this game and still and it was that was the wild wild west right it's 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 tough it's it's hard you can't keep track of it all like like you were saying ethan and and you just you have to do what the 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 hand that you're dealt and it's just, it's the world that we live in. We're just basically in the state of purgatory where we're just waiting on if the NCAA is even going to be governing this moving forward. They're definitely not going to be doing college football probably here in the next five years. I think we're all kind of on that. And then, you know, what happens when March Madness is like, you know what, we're going to, we're going to do our own thing too. So they could definitely follow suit there. So 
Ethan, Seth Wilson says he's hitting the portal. I don't think that's much of a surprise. Um, do you do you think I – w- I don't want to say he's the – he's literally the first person to go in, but it seems like he's not necessarily the first domino to fall because I, I feel like when you kind of use that phrase, right, you it's one, then after the other, then after the other, and it's just this continual thing. When – when are we going to start, I guess, seeing moves one way or another? Because something's going to break first, right? Coach is going to bring in more of his guys and, and what he wants, and then those guys will hit, or those guys will say, hey, you know, maybe they work it out with uh, DeVries and 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 some decide to stay. Like, how do you see this, this playing out, and when does that kind of first domino really start falling? Yeah, it surprised me that it took nearly two weeks since the end of – West Virginia season for somebody to enter. Um, I, I thought, I thought for sure, like some of the guys wouldn't even wait for the coach to be hired. Uh, I thought they would leave during the search. Uh, I think a lot of the guys are in the same boat uh, where they could transfer down, play 25, 30 minutes a game, uh, start every game, like just get playing time. Maybe, maybe uh, some could transfer closer to home. Um, but only Seth Wilson's entered the portal and that was yesterday. Um, so I've done a pretty bad job at predicting when these guys are going to enter because it's just, it's, it was hard. It's just hard to tell. Um, so now I'm just, now I'm thinking once the settles in tomorrow, uh, maybe, maybe if he meets with the rest of the team, you can maybe start seeing more dominoes fall in the Friday, um, or, once compliance opens back up on Monday. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't, it's, it's hard for me to see a lot of these guys staying just with everything that's went on in the program the last year. And um, now, now they actually have an external hire. It's, it's no, what nobody related uh, to hugs. So it, it's just hard for me to see a lot of these guys staying. I agree. I, I think we'll see probably something, a mass exodus, uh, next week or early next week and and then we'll see how that shakes with our new roster uh go going off a little bit off the script here with i want to ask an analytics question because i know maybe i know you haven't had a chance to interview and and ask coach of any questions yet but he's a young innovative coach um obviously we're coming from the hugs era that was more old school um, we did blend in some analytics. I like to think that I was one of the pioneers actually with uh, <laughs> the deflections during press Virginia, then Tyler Chang and those guys took it to another level. And we slowly started uh, implementing some analytics, but Ren Baker, I know talked about Kempom in, in his press conference of how to look um, for, for, an, for, for a coach that he wants. He talked about defensive efficiency <laughs> Um, which I love. I mean, you look at Houston and, and Iowa State right now, the two best defensive teams are still playing. And you look at Ken Palm, 13 out of the top 14 teams are all still in the dance right now. Um, how how do you see Coach DeVries from an analytical standpoint? I, I've, obviously, there's got to be a fine balance. You can't be solely dependent on analytics, but you, I, there's, there's, there's got to be a happy medium. How, do you know anything with his background of how – his staff of who he could be bringing uh, from an analytical mindset of how they could attack the portal. And then team wise, I know I just asked you like seven questions. Yeah, no, <laughs> you're good. Um, I, I think it, his teams at Drake were actually kind of hard to find a pattern uh, with, mm-hmm. especially looking at Ken Palm. Um, it, I mean, he, he always had 20 wins at least during his six years at Drake, but looking analytically, like sometimes they were mediocre on offense and defense. Um, but then other times they'd have top 50 offensive and defensive teams. So it, it was kind of like a inconsistent pattern of like, they've had good years offensive defensively, and then they've had okay years. Um, but he still has been able, he's still able to get 20 wins each season at least and get them to the yeah. tournament three yeah. times. Um, and, but, and then I look at, I look at pace a lot. Uh, it, I kind of, I think it's a, especially on Ken Palm, I think it's a good, it's a good way. It's just, it's just seeing how many possessions you get in a full uh, 40 minutes or 100 possessions uh, in a certain time. Uh, and, and his teams are kind of right in the middle, 150th in the country. So um, 
it's it's not going to be like this past season where it was pretty slow, minus Kirk Creasa maybe. But yeah. um, analytically, I I think offensively they're favored a lot. They've that that's been the more consistent uh, variable that he's had at Drake. They've usually been in the top 80, 90, usually kind of around the 40, 50 range in the country. Um, and then defensively, they always play man, so it's a lot like it's a lot like Hugs' defenses here. Um, they rarely – they played zone like four possessions all season this year. So it's like a really rare occasion. So defensively, it's pretty pretty straightforward uh, analytically as well. I know the administration this year has been pretty big, whether they've outright said it or, or have alluded to it that with this hire and, and DeVry, or the person at the time they were talking, who they were going to hire, it was going to be a clean break from, from hugs. It was, it was time to start new. It was time to start fresh. It was time for a new culture. And I, I think most of us understand that and get that. And, you know, I, I think recently what's gone on is I would also say that most people, it, when you look at the whole picture of, of Bob Huggins, right, it's a positive one, you know, recent events can blur the mind, but I think from um, just, full picture, you know, we, you know, he's huggy bear, but I also think there's something about not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? Is you, you do have this culture here in West Virginia. That's, that's a hugs or die, or, you know, a hugs type of person or die, but you also have, Hey, you know, we need what's best for this program. We need what's best for West Virginia basketball. We need to kind of return it back to its glory days. And we need a young innovative culture that we can now establish under coach DeVries. And so I think in a way, both things can be true, but do you see kind of a glue guy like like a um like a like a Deshaun Butler kind of being retained under DeVries? Or do you think he comes in and just wipes out everyone and saying, like, I just got to do things my way, which I think both are understandable, but you know, there there's obviously the right way to do things in how you kind of see it on paper and analytically. And this was always my guys for this, that, and the other thing. But you also there's that factor of having the fan base involved as well and having that support and it, you may need a Butler type hire. Where do you think as he puts together his staff, will there be any hugs guys or will there, how do you see that playing out? Yeah. So Doris staff at Drake is relatively small. Um, they had, they had a few main assistants, but uh, as they're looking for a new coach, they promoted his top assistant. Uh, for as an interim in the meantime mm -hmm. um so it's i don't it's hard for me to predict like how many guys he brings over from drake um i do feel like there's a chance that he could retain a guy or two uh especially if guys outside of his drake staff that he knows are already hired um and i think that's important for the program to at least have somebody that understands the culture I, th I think it's going to be overwhelming for Dries and it's overwhelming for most people that, that don't really understand what West Virginia is like at first. I think it's going to be overwhelming. Uh, I think he'll underrate how high he is on the totem pole in the state. And I think that can be a little overwhelming. So if you have somebody that like any of those former players that were assistants or somebody that's been in the program uh, for years, I think that's important to at least have, somebody on staff uh, that that just understands what's going on in Morgantown. So it's easier to adjust uh, and get comfortable for Dries, especially with the portal. Like it's, he's going to recruit pretty much a whole team and he's trying to settle in Morgantown. It's just a lot to deal with. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Ethan. And I, I would imagine he's going to bring, I don't know. Um, like you said, his top assistant guy is interim. If he doesn't get the job, obviously he's going to have a seat at the table at West Virginia on his staff. I, I I would be shocked if he doesn't bring almost his whole staff over because you got to be loyal to the guys that got you the high major job. You, you got to ride and die with those guys because they were there when you were making what 300, 400,000. Now you're making three mil a year. You, you, five times your salary and I, I've always felt like you owed it to your, to your staff, but it will be interesting whether he blends in a Deshaun Butler or he blends in a, another guy that's got a little more high major experience, maybe a guy from the Dana Altman tree or Greg McDermott tree that um, DeVries comes from. But uh, um, what are your expectations? The pressure's at 11 a.m. tomorrow. I think we'll know a lot more. Um, 
it seems that sometimes at the press conferences you'll get a couple guys that'll be on staff that will appear. Any expectations um, headed into the presser at 11 a.m. tomorrow to call see him? Yeah, I, th- I think my main expectation is uh, I've seen a lot of fans mention that they want to go. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I think that's kind of goes back to my last point of, I mean, Ren Baker admitted it like during his first year on the job, he, he kind of underestimated uh, West Virginia's fan base and, and more so just how highly he is uh, respected and, and how yeah. much West Virginia fans care about uh, their sports and the university. So I, I expect a lot of people to be there tomorrow for 11, for an 11 a.m. press conference on a Thursday. Um, and then I'm, I am curious, like out of the players, out of the current roster, out of, uh, out of Josh Eilert's staff, at least, um, cause they're still here. Their, their contracts are still ongoing. Um, I'm just curious who's, who's going to show up. And, uh, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure the people who are able to show up and care about the program will, will be there. The chat is alive and well. Again, we thank Ethan Bach for coming on. If you have a question for Ethan Bach, please throw it in the chat. We'll get to it right after this ad. The Ryan and Ryan. The Ryan and Ryan said the Ryan and Ryan show. The Ryan and Russ show, can't forget myself, is brought to you by 1111 Media. If you run a small business and want to get more customers, talk to the local marketing experts at 1111 Media. Visit 11 11.media. That's 11-11.media to learn more and get a free strategy session for your business. 1111 Media, helping small businesses get more customers. As you can see, 1111 Media made our website, ryanandrush.com, at the bottom of your screen there. Go check it out. We're working on building a blogging team together, hopefully to get that launched this summer uh, before football starts. Um, obviously we're joined by the master blogger that is Ethan. So don't worry, Ethan, we're not, we're not coming for you. We're just, uh, trying to get a little website going. We, we, we love you and we'll, we, we never try to do that to you, but no, I, I'll support you guys. It no, matter. I know. I, I know. I know you will. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're, you're the iron man. Ethan. Sharpens we, iron. <laughs> iron sharpens iron as they yep. say, and feel free to, you know, launch a Bach bomb. If you, if you see it coming on through your, <laughs> on your phone, uh, throughout this episode, we have, we're joined by WU. Mountaineer layer with Kenny. Hey, Ryan and Rush or Ethan, do you think we will keep players? So there's there's a great question for you, Ethan, right there. Is do are we keeping any of these players that are here? I'm I'm leaning towards I'm leaning like I I think during the search and in between uh Josh Eilert and Darren Dries, just that transition. I was thinking like three to four guys. You keep at least half that have eligibility. Um, I feel like now I'm leaning towards less than three to four guys at this point. I guess, yeah. What's the over under? I probably said two and a half. Yeah, Yeah. two and a half or three and a half. Maybe three. (laughs) 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 Um, I I just think, I I think a lot of these guys are in the same boat. I talked about er earlier. They could, they could transfer down, uh, play 25, 30 minutes uh, at a mid-major school, which is not, there's nothing wrong with that at all, um, and transfer closer to home. Um, or they roll the dice with what Dereese is bringing from Drake. Um, you don't know what he's going to get in the portal. He already has a high school signee from Josh Eilert's staff and Carmelo Atkins. He could also bring his signees from Drake as well. He's got two this year. There's just a lot of moving parts, and I talked about it, talked about it earlier. Like these guys stayed, or a lot of them stayed in between hugs and Eilert. Um, and I just think now it's 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 that it is the it is the turn of the page for the new era. So um, if these guys if these guys stay under Dereese, that's that's a lot of commitment. Um, it's just a new staff. It's not the staff they originally committed to. So. Um, I think over under I'd say is three and a half confidently. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm curious who stays because outside of uh, Creesa and Farrakhan, I think a lot of these guys are and, and Kobe Johnson as well. I think these guys are in the same boat um, where they definitely can weigh their options. And I, I think going down to a mid major uh, starting playing 30 minutes is a little bit more sexier than, uh, some of the roles they have on this team now. I think it'll be one or two. Um, if it was me, 
<laughs> this this may sound harsh. I wouldn't keep any of them. Um, I I think you just you got to cut cut ties with 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 the previous regime. Um, they finished in last. They were the worst team in the Big Twelve. That's just a matter of the facts. And I I think it's just we've talked about it on this show, Rush. That I think you're just it's a it's a culture year. Um, and it's uh, yeah. about to. It, but at the same time, if like a guy like Kobe Johnson or or Pat Sumnick or or a role guy that wants to to embrace the new culture and 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 be a role guy, yes. But I can't see the guys that expect to be star players buying into the new culture. They came to play for Hugged or they came to play for Josh. I can't see them buying into playing for for the new regime and because their minutes won't be the same, their leash won't be the same, their their freedom won't be the same. So I, I I'd be sh- really surprised if like a Kerr came back and Noah came back or, or any of those guys, just because that's not what they signed up to come here. And I, I think it's probably best for both parties. So may, maybe one or two role guys, but I, I mean, DeVries has got to do what he's got to do. It's, it's his way. I mean, we already are going to get our go-to guy. It's going to be his son. That's going to be the guy that's going to get the majority of the looks when the game's hard. And then, also, and Ethan is, I think that um, we don't know who DeVries is connected to, like Tucker DeVries, that is. Mm-hmm. Who has he played with on the AAU circuit? Who has who is he good friends with? Just those guys are all connected. They all talk Instagram, Twitter. Um, it, maybe they attracted a couple of high major transfers that want to play with the guy that Tucker DeVries, but they weren't going to play with them at Drake. And, but now that he's at West Virginia, they may come to Morgantown. That, that's that's just my opinion on it. Yeah, I think I think a lot of fans um, don't understand, and and it's a and it's not their fault. It's a concept that really hasn't yeah. been talked about. Um, but like player connections is such a huge thing in the transfer portal. Uh, I think I think I think fans kind of view it as high school recruiting. You have that coach's connection, but it's a little bit more than that. Um, just looking at West Virginia lat or last couple years. Uh, I, Eric, Eric Stevenson, and Emmett Matthews knew each other from mm-hmm. the state of Washington. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, like Jose Perez hosting pretty much every single transfer recruit they had during the spring. Um, just kind of building that relationship. Uh, the, like Raekwon Battle knew Eric and Emmett. Like there's, there's different connections, especially the last two years at WVU uh, that play a part and that goes around the entire country. Obviously coaching connections are a huge thing. It still matters, but that player connection uh, aspect to it is kind of an underrated uh, kind of view on it. And I think too, like Ryan, you brought this up, like, and I agree with you here is if P if any players were to stay, I think they're going to be the more role type players as well. I think Kobe and Pat are kind of perfect. Ofri, yeah, or yeah, yeah, like like he, young, where you saw the potential, but needs to get more right. Like it's not that you're saying Kerr and Noah aren't good players. You're just saying it's like, dude, it's just once you've kind of there's just been such culture dysfunction, I'll say, and so much uh-huh. when your focus is so much more behind the scenes than it is on the basketball court. It's just it's like you said, it's just best for both parties. You're not saying you're not a good basketball player. It's not you're not even talking X's and O's. It's just like, let's just do what's for best. We wish each other the best. Like, thank you. You know, we endured together. But hey, let's let's clean start, clean slate this thing. I agree. Cause because here's another thing too with with the culture. And we, we've talked about this, Ryan. I'd love to get your take on this, Ethan. Is right with the transfer portal, you, you have the good side of it, you have the bad side of it, right? I think Eric Stevenson is the great example of what the transfer portal can be right is like he yeah. comes in he's the x factor he gets huggins to his lap what ends up being his last march madness tournament just stone cold killer great culture guy embraces it stills coming around like love eric stevenson or you have the jose perez right where it's like he just quit at arizona and you know what's going on there type of thing and and everywhere in between and i think those are the extremes we've seen at west virginia right so there's a reason sometimes these guys are on their third, fourth, fifth school because there's been a coaching change or it's not what they were promised. And you know, it hasn't been fair for the player and they deserve to have their right fit. Or it's been, Hey, maybe no one's gotten along with this player. And there's always kind of been an issue there. So the take on this, I think is what DeVries brings is not only an excellent coaching um, 
you know, you, you brought it. He's had six 21 seasons and he's done them all a little differently. They, they haven't been mm-hmm. identical. He knows what, you know, even with conference expansion, right? The Midwest is still so important to the big 12. And I, he brings in that Midwest, that Iowa, you know, Nebraska, wherever he's been type mind to West Virginia, which is still very beneficial, but he's also bringing in Tucker and probably a lot other of these Drake guys, because he knows he can build a culture and maybe, Maybe we don't make the tournament next year, but you 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 instead kind of look at the long term and say, hey, like let's just get young, good guys that learn how to mesh together. We'll figure out how to pay them, and we keep building, building, and then you know two, and then in two years we'll kind of bring some guys that need a home, those experienced guys that need pieces, and then you know year three we'll take off, right? What? So you you can try to bring it all around, or you can try to do kind of the conservative play at this. Where do you think that sweet spot is? Because we also, the other side too, Brian's brought this up. We've seen Missouri. Two year ago, years ago, they make the mm-hmm. tournament. Last year, they don't even get an SEC win. Like you can overdo yeah. this two year one. Yeah. Yeah. I I think with the transfer portal, it's not meant to uh, just rebuild a team every single year. Obviously you can. Uh, I don't think it's, I, I think it gets over draining uh, for a staff, and I think it can be not beneficial uh, when you have a bad year. Um, so I, I think the transfer portal should be used as like kind of like UConn. Um, they win a national it's title, and then they go, yeah, you, you win a national title, go get Cam Spencer, kind of plug him in. Um, I, I think I think that's how you're supposed to do it. Uh, but you win, you win with veterans now. But at the same time, you have to retain guys so they're playing with each other for a few years still. Um, but I, th- I think with Darren Dries, it should be you go out, get your Drake guys. I agree with you guys. It's a culture year. You, you establish a culture. They 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 kind of need an identity again. Um, mm-hmm. I think recently they lost it. I don't know if that's – I don't know if that was at, just because of everything with hugs at the end or um, – I, I just think Dries needs, needs a new – culture set new identity uh go get the drake guys that that can play in the big 12 and then see who who see who you can retain from this current roster that wants to stay here and then just uh fill and plug with the rest of transfer portal or whether that's a late 2024 kid or if that's uh his signees at drake uh just just plug and play pretty much and then i think long term anytime you get into the off season you lose a couple guys at graduation or an occasional portal guy. You just you just go out into the portal. All right, we need perimeter shooting. Go get a shooter. We need a big that can defend. You do that. I I, I think I think West Virginia did a great job at, at what they could do with the transfer portal the last two years, um, especially during last summer. It mm-hmm. seemed like they retooled their team two to three times in one off season. They had it, it was like the longest off season ever. <laughs> um, they're still getting portal guys in August, but I, I think yeah. I think it's overwhelming for a staff to to try to get seven to eight guys every single off season. Um, and even though even if those guys are talented, I think it takes I think it takes a couple years to uh, for them to play together to even get them to that national championship contentionship. I I completely agree, Ethan. I I think. I think I and I said it multiple times on the show. I think Iowa State's the model. I think Iowa State what they did uh, when Otzelberger came over from UNLV, he brought Caleb Grill, who I know they had a falling out in the end, but that kind of was like his son at the time. Like he had brought him from Iowa State to Vegas, and then he brought brought him back from Vegas to Iowa State. Um, I, I think DeVries will try and win a little bit the first year, just because his son's going to be a senior. If, if we didn't have the Tucker element, I would say it would be the Notre Dame model, completely rebuild. But when your son's a senior and he's going to be the best player, I feel like he's obligated to try and win a little bit. But like you said, man, you you, you got to get the right guys in here that are going to buy into the culture, whether they're sophomore transfers or um, th- that, that'd that be the best case scenario, getting some sophomore transfers in here or uh, guys transferring after their freshman year that have multiple years that can get year one out of the system um, under DeVries. And then we can build this thing 
year one. Maybe, maybe we make the tournament. I think we can with, with Tucker and maybe another, maybe another uh, couple impact guys. Maybe we get in, maybe we win a game. Um, and then year two, you sustain. And then year three, you're contending just like Iowa state. So um, that that's kind of been the model that seems to best, best suit uh, what we're looking for. Uh, Kate, I mean, what do you think of K state the way they've done it? I feel like they, they were too hit or miss on the portal and that's why in year number two, they've kind of taken a step back. Yeah. I, I, I think K state's a perfect example, kind of uh, like an, as an op- opposition to the Iowa state example. Uh, I thought Tang did the Tang and his staff. As soon as they got in there, did a did a really underrated job. Like Keontae Johnson and pairing that with Marquise Noel and Naquan Tomlin, it was it was a good it was a good rotation. Um, but then just that second that second year, and you get Tyler Perry, Arthur Kaluma, you lose Tomlin with just everything that went on uh, in December, and it's just it seemed like they lost all momentum after an elite eight year and in, in a couple months. And it was because of the transfer portal. They couldn't, they couldn't get the same type of guys that they had from that prior year. So now Tang, Tang loses all his momentum. I think he's still a great coach. I think he can get K state back to where they were at uh, two years or two seasons ago now. Um, but it's, it, that's just the way it is with the transfer portal. Yeah. West Virginia is so unique too. Cause right. We're a power four, five, six, whatever league and whatever conferences are playing, whatever yeah. leagues are still around when, when this is going on. But of course, a power school, but you represent a whole state. So there's no, I guess, in-state rival you're really competing with, but you're also one of the smaller states, right? But, you know, in your neck of the woods, you also have like the Penn States, Ohio States, you know, obviously Pitt, Virginia. But it it's just, it's, it's I think the fear that that West Virginia has, and this is the first example that that's come to mind. And I, I think this just fits whether you're a player, coach, whoever is like what we saw last year with the women's coach and Don and just like stepping stone. Okay. Go to where you want to. And that's, that's not where we want to be. I, I don't think because yeah. it's, we're, we're very welcoming cult. Like, right. You're coming in. You still want like, welcome home. Like the reason you may have never been to West Virginia, but welcome home. Right. It's that very, like you come in, you've come to our house. It's very comforting. And we expect you to stay a while. However, that doesn't mean guys can't come here, whether they're players, coaches, you know, have two, three years success here and go somewhere else. Cause in a way, I mean, yeah, it stinks that they left somewhere else and you, but you've had two or three great years. So what does that, you know, say about that? So I think where it relates to the basketball team and transfer portal and the guys, I think what we're all saying is you want those two to three, maybe four freshmen, sophomore, like those two to three year players that are, you know, they bought into the culture. You you can call on them when you need them there. They have higher potential to stay around another year or two. They, they, they're they more, Hey, what do we need for the team? And then it goes into what you said, Ethan, right? Where you bring in those Eric Stevenson, those, Hey, we need, we need just, a, you know, a six year senior. That's just big and can control the paint, right? bring him in like, and then that's where you kind of bring your, your fill in pieces. So it's a very, I've always felt, and I think we all realize this West Virginia is very unique, but you can manipulate it in a way that benefits the the culture, the fandom, the, you know, just the, the, the sports teams. It's just, I think there's a little more, uh, uh, you, manipulation that goes on behind the scenes that doesn't on the surface. A lot of fans are like, he's leaving like rich rods leaving. Right. And, and, you know, that was a terrible way to like, I think most fans agree that was an awful way to go, but it's like the reason he's leaving to go to Michigan is like, we just almost had a chance at a national championship. Right. So like understanding that component as well. And I, I, I think that's just in terms of basketball, the best formula you're going to get is, you try to retain four to five guys every year, and then you just got to plug in place everywhere else. And you're going to lose guys too. You have to accept that, that you're just yeah. going to lose guys. It's every, hard. every team loses guys now. It's not, it, I think, I think at first in the transfer portal, West Virginia fans freaked out. They lost one or two guys to the portal, but it's just every team's going to lose a guy, whether it's your star player or whether that's a walk on. Um, top to bottom, teams lose players. And I think from a coach's standpoint, and I, I just kind of viewing West Virginia's job, like obviously the state of the program currently 
uh, is is pretty low. I I would say compared uh, compared to where Hugs had it at. Um, but I think there's that opportunity for Darren Dries to bring that back up. And I think West Virginia is a top 20, top 15 job in the country. Um, so there's that to that too. I think, I don't, I think West Virginia, the only time they should be a stepping stone is if you're losing a coach or a player to a blue blood, whether yeah, exactly. that's, that's the, the traditional blue bloods with IU and UCLA, and then the current blue bloods are the new bloods with Gonzaga, Baylor, Houston, et cetera. So um, I, I think that's the only time West Virginia should ever be losing a coach or, or a player too. I think that makes sense. It did, yeah. No, I mean, it does make sense. It is a top 20 job. I, I know it's at its low point last year, just with how things have transpired over the last couple of years. But uh, before we get out of here, Ethan, I know, I know you're a busy man. Um, what else we got going on over at the portal report? Pl- plug some of the portal report. Cause I know you're going to be a busy, busy man, um, over the next couple months. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a lot of, uh, new exciting things this, this off season at, at, uh, at TPR we got, so we're doing men's tracking every single men's entry, which we're over a thousand now. <laughs> and, and we, like I said, we oh, haven't yeah. even played, we haven't even played sweet 16 games. There were about 1800 last off season to put that in comparison. And that goes all the way until August. So uh, probably going to beat 1800 this year. Um, then tracking, uh, tracking the women's side as well. I think, I think coaches mm-hmm. on that side are, are finally starting to get, uh, to get acclimated with the transfer portal. And it's starting to get a little chaotic, like the men's. Uh, There's about 700 of the women's players in comparison to the men's. Um, Then also we launched this year a fan uh, subscription. So it's, you get to track every single team in the country um, who they've contacted in the portal, who's visiting, who's committed, who's left uh, all that jazz. So we've also, also wanted to get the fans involved, try to uh, make it a little bit easier to track it. Yeah. Uh, because it's like I said, it's impossible. <laughs> hey, but you're doing the best you can, right? Yeah, that's that's all you that's all you can ask for. When when you hey. track like that, you've reached out to. How do you do that? It's just you gotta. It has to be a public. Yeah, so uh, we'll reach out to the anybody that's entered. Um, just kind of b- bother them, honestly. <laughs> just you bother them. Yeah, get get a contact list. Um, that's now been like the new thing. I think the good thing about the transfer portal is I think it's extended college basketball uh, fans interest in the sport. I think you go now you go from October, November to uh, April and May. I think you extend it a little bit by a few weeks, maybe to a month just with the portal. I think a lot of fans get, get interested and they get invested in seeing those contact lists, seeing which transfers they can get just another recruiting cycle. So um, yeah, we, we get, we'll get the contact list from the players and then uh, usually Arkansas is on every, every single. (laughs) Yeah. Um, That's right. Our, our, our boy, uh, James Herring at Radford. That's another school. It seems that Radford seems to be on uh, almost everybody's list as well. So, so you got, you got some coaches in the game that are really dedicated to the transfer portal. And and that's a cool thing to see. Um, let's do some basic math, everybody. So we're talking about how everybody is going to lose guys in the portal. There's how many in the portal right now? A thousand. Yep. Roughly. There's 360 programs. Uh, 16 of them clearly are still playing in the NCAA. I think there's six left in the NIT. There's two in the CBI, two in the CIT. So roughly 30 still playing. So 330 programs. Times three around a thousand eight. So on average, the teams that are done playing have already lost an average of three players, and it's not even the sweet sixteen yet. So yeah, everybody's gonna lose about five or six players on average, and that's not including the seniors that are graduating. So change is inevitable in college basketball. I just want I, I just want to do a basic math breakdown because it's crazy that we already have these programs averaging three departures, and it's not even April one yet. And like you said, it doesn't even include. Uh, seniors that are graduating or guys that are yeah. uh, going to the NBA. Um, so yeah, freshmen coming I, in. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah. So 
it's it's just a lot of moving parts in in college basketball, and I do think it sucks for the fans because it's not. I think back in the old era, you were able to uh, create that bond with a player for four years, and I think that was a cool thing. And that's something you really don't get anymore. It's on a rare occasion. Um, and I just think I, I, I think one bad thing with just college basketball in general now on the men's side, at least this isn't on the women's side at all. There's just no marketable stars on the men's side this this year, at least. And maybe in the last couple of years, I think you have your Armando Baycott's, your Zach Eadies. Yeah. yeah, they're great players. Yeah, they're but. It's it's not like Caitlin Clark on the women's side, Angel Reese. Uh, you don't have you don't you really don't have those. I think Baycott's your closest thing you got uh, to having a marketable star, and that's because he stayed in college for five years. Hey, there, like there's Edie. kind of a. <laughs> I, I like Edie a lot. I, I, I think, but it, but the thing with Edie is, is like it's 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 almost like every single. Big men in college basketball has been great the last few years, like Oscar Shibway. They don't, they're not developing their perimeter game or uh, their their dribble game, playmaking game. That's that's all it is in the NBA. Everybody's every center in the NBA is, has to be a Nikola Jokic or a Joel Embiid. You have to do everything. And Zach Eady, as great as he is in the paint um, and and on defense, it, it's he. I don't know how he can fit in the NBA. Uh, just just off of like he, he's not going to get drafted top five just it's not he would 20 maybe 15 20 years ago but not anymore because he can't shoot that bad time bad era to be a big man he, he well it could have been phil powski could have been the face but then you know some yeah. other events happened <laughs> Yeah, and no one on this podcast got in trouble for their comments on that at all. No, I didn't no get in way. trouble. I just stated my stance on it, and some yeah. people just were offended. <laughs> you took the charge, and you backed yeah, it up. Too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm not backing down to them. <laughs> well, Ethan, thank you so much for coming on. Obviously, the press conference is tomorrow, eleven o'clock, open to the public at the Coliseum. Uh, Ryan and I will be here tomorrow to break down that press conference and everything that comes with that. Ethan, I'm sure we'll have you on again in the near future. Uh, I'm sure at one time, uh, I'm starting to feel this way, Ethan, maybe you obviously with diaper going on, started feeling this a couple years ago, starting to feel kind of how Ryan felt. It's like you, you kind of are thinking like, okay, we got it kind of a pause, like a little bit of a break coming up. It's the end of the season. You're like, wait, wait, this is ramping up. Like this just yeah. like at the season, like this is only ramping up. I can only imagine, like you were saying, how college coaches feel. It's like yeah. you kind of had that lull after where you could just breathe right before you hit the recruit trail or that. And it just, it just doesn't exist anymore. So um, as they say, we'll, we'll sleep in May or June, or maybe we're just done sleeping. Maybe the sleeping days are over. No, but no sleep, no sleep anymore. No sleep. We'll sleep when we die. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> yes. Ethan, thank you again so much for, for coming on and all your knowledge. Enjoy the press conference tomorrow. Uh, we love you all. Go Mountaineers, and we'll see you again tomorrow. See you guys. Go Mountaineers. <laughs>